Okay, well, thank you all. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, it's really great. So I'm going to talk to you a little today about um, two sets of data, um, which we actually recently published, one from humans and one from a um, kind of line of research we are developing here at Wake Forest, where we're doing TMS and non-human primates, we're attempting to. So, um, so you all know about state averse stimulation, probably. Um, sorry, if this is in the way. Um, so theta burst is, um, is a patterned form of brain stimulation. Um, so the co most common ways in which we were um, kind of taught initially to stimulate in a repetitive way with TMS would be one hertz stimulation, and that's just one pulse per second. Um, and there's usually no off time. Um, or 10 hertz TMS would be just sort of 10 pulses per second. Um, Typically when delivered therapeutically, there might be like two seconds on, so 20 stimulations, and then maybe eight seconds off. Um, 10 hertz stimulation is probably the one that's actually used the most um, because of its clinical indications. Um, and uh, in most protocols, you're giving about 3000 pulses of 10 hertz stimulation per dose, um, kind of as, Alex mentioned, um, I sort of have a foot in both camps. We do a lot of um, clinical interventions, trying to develop TMS um, as a tool for addiction. Um, but I was trained as a basic scientist. And um, like many of you, uh, it really bothers me that we really don't have an optimal dose yet. And there's a lot we don't quite understand about dosing. Um, and so I kind of play in that world a little as well. Um, so, um, then we came, then along came theta burst, right? And so theta burst was built off of um, kind of some principles that our preclinical friends taught us uh, about learning and memory. And so it is the case that in hippocampal neurons, if you, they will naturally fire at kind of a theta rhythm um, in a theta rhythm sort of predicts acquisition of a new skill. Um, and you can induce a theta, a bursting theta rhythm into these hippocampal um, CA1 cells, um, and they will um, have some type of LTP-like effect. So Huang and colleagues in 2005 um, were the first ones to demonstrate that this might be possible in humans as well, to induce an LTP-like effect in the brain um, by applying theta burst. And I'm gonna get into more details of that in a second, but just by comparison, this is sort of a common uh, figure that you'll see in talks, um, that continuous theta burst was originally thought to, to create a decrease in cortical excitability, while intermittent theta burst was thought to create an increase in cortical excitability. And in this case, they actually only used 600 pulses of theta burst for the intervention. So um, it's a fraction of the um, number of pulses for a fraction of the amount of time, which engendered a lot of enthusiasm in the field and still has. And so if we look at this initial paper by Huang and colleagues um, out of the UK, um, what they really did is they took um, 600, they did 600 pulses and they tried three different types of theta burst stimulation. One was intermittent, two seconds on, 10 seconds off, um, one was an intermediate form of um, theta burst, which very few people uh, actually recall about this paper, where they did five seconds on and 15 seconds off. And then they just did a continuous protocol where there was no off time. In all of these cases, they, um, they delivered 600 pulses. And what they found was that um, 600 pulses of intermittent theta burst caused an increase in cortical excitability. Those are the um, triangles and the line on the top of the graph. Um, and so that increase in excitability was associated with intermittent protocols, um, whereas the lower line, so the line on the very bottom, that was the continuous theta burst stimulation. Um, and that was um, thought to be a net inhibitory effect on cortical excitability. So people got very excited about this um, 600 pulse intervention, particularly that intermittent for 600 pulses causes an increase in cortical excitability. Um, so that was very exciting. CTBS was thought to induce a decrease in excitability. This was so popular that as you can see here in this graph, I hope you can see it in my box is not in the way, but as you can see here in the graph, 
the first study was done in 2005, and there was an asymptotic rise um, in all the way up to 2019 or 2018 when we, uh, my graduate student made this graph for us. Um, one paper created this huge surge in the number of people that were using 600 pulses of intermittent theta burst stimulation. So uh, obviously there was a lot of um, excitement in the field, so much excitement that our clinical colleagues decided to do a head-to-head -head comparison of 10 hertz TMS for the treatment of depression versus intermittent theta burst stimulation for the treatment of depression. You can imagine from a patient treatment perspective, um, this is you know, very seductive, right? Instead of having the patient sit in a chair for 28 minutes, they only had to sit in the chair for three minutes. Um, instead of getting 3,000 pulses, they only had to get 600 pulses. Um, and what this um, large study found, um, it was a large sample of almost 400 individuals with treatment-resistant depression. All individuals received, I think it was um, 20 sessions of theta burst stimulation at 120% of the motor threshold over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and there was a comparable remission and response rate between the two groups. And it was based on these data, the FDA determined that intermittent theta burst at 600 pulses um, had equivalence um, to our standard 10 Hertz treatment um, and therefore could be used in the treatment of patients. So that was um, in theory, in some ways, a big win for the field, um, especially because of the efficiency. Um, so you could, that's launched this whole group of, um, this whole area of research, which is now looking into accelerated protocols or stacking multiple protocols in a day um, in order to increase the clinical efficacy. But you know, Perhaps you guys are the same way as I am. You know, we really don't know very much about even what the standard 10 hertz, 3000 pulse intervention is doing. Um, and so Gamboa and colleagues um, kind of put another wrinkle in the story in 2010 when they published a paper that showed if you double the number of pulses, so instead of 600, you do 1200 pulses, ITBS, which is shown on the left half of this um, slide, will suddenly become a net, have a net inhibitory effect rather than an excitatory effect. And likewise, when you double the dose or you deliver 1200 pulses of CTBS per session, CTBS will cause a net excitatory effect. That's very odd, right? What are the chances that we just happen to kind of guess at a interval and that would switch. Um, so it's very challenging to understand why this might be the case. Um, but nonetheless, it existed um, and it made us think a little more closely about the effect of pulse number on TMS effects on cortical excitability. And so um, the story goes, I was actually presenting um, some research uh, at the brain stimulation meeting in Singapore um, in uh, probably like 2015, and somebody in the audience raised his hand. We were, at the time we were using 3,600 pulses of CTBS to the medial prefrontal cortex. And this very smart individual raised their hand and they said, wait a minute, you know, 3,600 pulses, that's never gonna work. Aren't you aware of the new study by Gamboa et al that shows that theta burst flips the effects? And so at every 600 pulses, you might expect that the effect of the TMS on cortical excitability would reverse. Um, and uh, you know, it was very um, intimidating to be asked that question on stage, but I also realized that in fact, we didn't actually know what 3,600 pulses of CTBS was doing to, when delivered to the motor cortex. And so I had a graduate student, Daniel Lynch, and Daniel was a first year graduate student at the time, um, just for some um, background, he was a first year rotating graduate student. Um, and I said, Daniel, we need to figure this out. And I want you to do a dosing study. We're gonna look at 600, 1200, 1800, and 3600 pulses of CTBS on the effects of motor cortex excitability. So um, Daniel is now a postdoc. Um, he was in our lab for five years um, and we just published the results of the study. So it took a really long time. Um, and we actually went through two graduate students to create the study, Dan and Daniel. Um, and Daniel did a dosing study for us on 
um, CTBS, and Dan did a dosing study for us on ITBS. Uh, and I'm very thankful to say that we just finally got that published, which I'll show you here. And so what we did, so in um, Dan's, ex Dan's experiment, um, we had um, ITBS dosing. So everybody was given, um, 30 individuals came into the lab um, and in a randomized order, all people received um, one experimental visit where they got 600 pulses, one experimental visit where they got 1200, one where they got 1800, and one visit where they got sham stimulation for 600 pulses. Um, and this is the first study that I'm aware of that um, incorporated a sham stimulation in sort of a TMS motor cortex excitability dosing study. So we thought that was really important. And when they came in, we um, tried to, um, we actually contacted the corresponding authors of some of the big papers that had preceded us. Um, there's now been a number of, um, of really good studies that have looked at test free test reliability and intermittent um, and continuous data burst. So we contacted those authors to figure out what their methods were and to the best of our ability, we tried to mimic them. We collected a resting motor threshold, um, active motor threshold and a one millivolt threshold for each person. We collected a baseline visit, um, so 20 um, volt, um, 20 um, sort of packets of TMS stimulation over the motor, motor cortex to determine a baseline. Um, we then, after the baseline intervened with either 612, 1800, or 600 pulses of sham TMS, and then in 10 minute intervals for a full hour, we sampled um, the motor of oak potential, right? So baseline, tap away at their head, and then in 10 minute intervals, we sampled their motor evoked potential. We tried to be very rigorous in the study. Um, we used a neuronavig, we used um, sort of head fixed position um, and guidance to make sure their head remained in, remained in the same position. We um, had them focus, we had them all watch the Planet Earth video series, such that they maintain some sort of static level of um, arousal throughout the experiment. They weren't allowed to get up or move from the chair in the 60 minute interval. Um, so we tried to be very rigorous and minimize any extraneous movement. Um, like I said, 30 participants, four visits per participant. Um, this same type of experimental design was used with CTBS um, because CTBS, we really wanted to get up to 3,600 pulses because that's what we were using in our clinical study. Um, we had a 600, 1200, 1800, 3,600 and a sham 600 pulse condition. Um, and again, in this case, the same fundamental experimental design. 30 participants and all participants in this case came back for five visits. Um, we um, wanted to really look at quality control. So, you know, the sort of probably the best thing to look at perhaps is the resting motor threshold over time. And as you can see in this graph here, our resting motor threshold um, did seem to be pretty stable for each individual on a visit by visit basis. You can see visit one, two, three, and four here, um, plus a fifth visit for CTBS. Um, so we felt pretty good about this. From a statistical perspective, there was no um, systemic difference in any of these motor thresholds. And the test re test reliability um, within an individual was very high as um, demonstrated by the interclass correlation coefficient. So we felt good about that from experimental perspective. And then here are the data. Um, sorry, this isn't the most clean slice, but so for the intermittent stimulation, what we found, so on this graph here, you have the baseline on the full left-hand side of the graph. Um, and then you have what the average motor evoked potential um, at zero minutes. So that would be immediately after the TMS intervention. And then at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes after stimulation. Um, the dashed line on the top is the motor evoked potential average after they receive sham TMS. Um, and what you'll see on both this graph and on the next graph, which represents the continuous state of birth stimulation, in both cases, the sham alone caused an increase in cortical excitability. Um, I think that's really important to remember, right? And as those of us on this sort of talk that have done motor evoked potentials, uh, and I was actually just teaching um, some students how to do this, the subtle changes in arousal for your participant will cause an increase in cortical excitability. So even having your participant just talk to you or laugh um, will cause an increase in motor cortex excitability. 
And so in some ways, it's not surprising at all that the sham stimulation alone, um, which in our case, right, we have um, we use a TMS coil with a spacer, um, we can mimic the feel of the TMS, to the best of our ability on the scalp, um, but also you could hear the auditory stimulation and feel the subtle kind of pressure change associated with a single pulse of TMS. In our, the sham again was used with a kind of foam spacer. So we knew that the magnetic field was not actually reaching the cortex, um, but again, the participant felt the actual um, pulsation of the TMS itself. And that alone seems to cause an increase in motor of potential. But then this effect kind of decays over time. When you look at this from a statistical perspective, it was ITDS 1200. So 1200 pulses of ITDS seemed to be the most effective way to induce a LTD-like effect on cortical excitability. Um, so this is actually the strongest finding of this, um, of this whole thing here. We had both a main effect of 1200 pulses as well as a time by treatment interaction for the 1200 pulses. Um, so I'm very excited at the moment about 1200 pulses of ITBS. Um, these data actually are consistent with the Gamboa paper. Um, and so that also sort of makes me feel pretty good about them. Um, CTBS, um, so what we found with CTBS, again, you can see here that the um, gray li dashed line is the sham, and there's some sort of increase following sham, and an increase following some of these other 600, 1200, and 1800 pulse protocols. It's actually the 3600 po pulse protocol, which is the black line on this graph, that actually doesn't seem to change immediately after stimulation, but there's a slow rise over time. Um, and peaking um, a little further into the experimental design itself. And in fact, it was this change in CTBS over time um, that um, seemed to be significant in this scenario. So there was a time by treatment interaction for 3,600 pulses of CTBS. And so in our case, this, from a CTBS perspective, the strongest effects were observed with 3,600 and it was a net increase in cortical excitability. So in some ways, this goes against the grain, right? We often think of CTBS, at least six, CTBS 600, as being a net inhibitory effect. Um, but in our case, we didn't actually find that to be the case. Um, instead, we found 3,600 pulses of CTBS um, to be, have a net excitatory effect um, that seemed to last for about 30, 60 minutes, um, with the highest levels being at 30 and 60 minutes. So that was actually very surprising to us. But one thing I would say, which um, many of you may also be aware of, is that the effects of data burst stimulation are really variable. Um, and in some ways, this is, um, this is, you know, it took a long time to go through these data. These are really pretty big data sets, actually, as you may have seen on some of the other slides. Um, and so we had the help of a, um, a biostatistician that created nice nested design um, multivariate models for us for each of these experiments. Um, and what we found actually is that there really, although there are these sort of average effects, um, it wasn't something as easy as some people tend to be, um, have a net increase for ITBS and others tend to have a net decrease and that's independent of pulse number. We also found that it's not as easy as um, 1200 pulses is the most reliable, whereas 600 pulses is the least reliable. In fact, if you look at this kind of heat map, um, this lists every subject enrolled in the study for the ITBS study and the CTBS study. And if, they're, um, if the square is red, it means they had a net increase in cortical excitability following that particular protocol. Um, and the blue means they had a net decrease. And you'll see as you look across the lines for each individual, there's very few people. In fact, on this whole thing, I think there are only two people that have the same color across the whole thing, like either, either red across the whole thing or um, blue across the whole thing. Um, actually, I'm sorry, there are only two people and they all have blue across the whole thing. But that's actually not very good, right? That means for the field, that means there's a lot of variance. Um, and that may not come as a, as a surprise to you because in the five years that it took us to create this study um, and collect all of these data, many other papers came out 
um, which they may not have done, looked at the effect of different doses of TMS um, or theta burst, but they certainly looked at variability for a given dose. Um, and there's many papers that talk about inter-individual variability in response to various theta burst stimulation protocols. So as a field that um, makes you concerned, right? Especially when I look at our, um, our clinical colleagues that are treating patients in um, clinic with intermittent theta bursts, I wonder to myself like, hmm, I don't know. Maybe the reason that the treatment efficacy is only like 30% is because there's so much variability in the effects of IGBS. And so actually I'm um, reading and colleagues um, published this great article um, many years ago now, um, kind of summarizing some of the things that influence um, variability in brain stimulation. Um, and this is particularly on, they base this particularly on um, cortical excitability in the motor system, I believe. Uh, and we did, we knew about this paper, of course, before we started our own study. And um, we tried the best that we could to control for each of these variables. Um, you can see here on the little black boxes, address the way that we try to um, address each of these things and control for them, um, like gender, male and female. We tried to have about the same amount um, in terms of physical activity, people were, um, remain still. Um, we tried to fix the time of day um, within an individual across the protocol. Um, these people tended to be young and presumably have, um, have pretty good um, healthy brains without a lot of atrophy. Um, and we tried to keep them focused on the sort of planet Earth video, um, such that they weren't um, in some varying state of cognitive arousal. Um, they were healthy, not on, um, not on um, psychiatric or neurologically uh, uh, prescribed pharmacotherapeutics. Um, we did not actually assess their um, genetics. That was one of the big um, unique things that the Huang and Gamboa studies did was um, to filter people by their BDNF genotype. Um, so these are all interesting factors that should be considered going forward. But wow, it's really hard to control for all of these things. And so one way to do that, to just shift um, a little bit, is to look at um, non-human primates. So, um, so this is a new line of research that we're evaluating in our lab here at Wake Forest. Um, I was at the Medical University of South Carolina for about 10 years and um, had the opportunity to do a lot of that work. And now I'm here at Wake Forest University and uh, we have a really strong non-human primate group. Um, and I'm particularly excited about developing a stronger relationship with you guys at Minnesota because you also have a stellar, um, amazing neuroimaging group, amazing non-human primate research. And obviously you guys are pioneers in brain modeling and TMS, et cetera, TDCS. So um, thank you so much again for this invitation. I can't wait to kind of mind meld all this stuff with you all. So this is an image of what our lab, our NHP um, lab looks like that we're, where we're doing the TMS. Um, just to kind of summarize, um, we are just sort of starting this line of research. We published a first paper last year. Um, and for these studies, our first objective was to just see if we could collect an MEP reliably um, to collect a motor threshold for animals in a reliable fashion um, and to collect a recruitment curve. And so you can see here, we're using neuro navigation um, with brain site um, to actually um, kind of, we have an MRI from each animal and we position the TMS coil over the um, motor cortex and presumably the hand knob, or in this experiment, we had two targets, both the hand knob and the leg area. Um, in our case, all of the animals are um, sedated and they're brought down with a little bit of ketamine and then they're kept um, sedated with isoflurane. We use isoflurane because compared to some of the other um, anesthetics we could use, it has been shown to have the least effects on cortical excitability. Um, so, so that's why we've been using that. I would love to do some awake behaving um, TMS experiments in NHPs, um, but I feel like we have to um, we have a little baby steps to do before we can get there. Um, and so these are sedated animals, which is going to have an effect, but I'm happy to say that even with some sedation, we find some really reliable data, in fact, maybe because of sedation. And so our first experiment here, um, we had five um, female rhesus animals, so they're um, pretty large size non-human primates as NHPs go. 
um, all animals came in for two visits. Um, and we did this um, to collect some test retest reliability for each animal. You can see here in the image kind of in the middle, we place the electrodes. In this case, we shave the animal's arm. We placed an electrode on the back of their hand, um, as well as on their um, forearm extensors muscles. Um, and we looked at the motor evoked potential in this particular joint here. And that was because we actually couldn't, we tried the um, hand or the fingers, um, but because of the size, we couldn't get a very good reliable signal. Um, so we collected it here from the, um, from the front paws. We also collected it from the feet, um, which you can't really see in this um, position, um, but in the same way, we put it on the dorsal aspects of their foot as well as their um, foot extensors. Um, we, you can see here, we did um, one of the experiments was done with a mag venture coil, one was done with a mag stim coil, um, two different experiments, but you can see here, we kind of used neuro navigation to position the TMS coil over the motor cortex. Um, and then we had test retest reliability. So all animals, um, we tried to get a motor threshold um, from both places. Um, and we had each animal come back um, twice. And so in fact, the motor threshold you can see here in this chart was um, pretty, pretty um, fixed or consistent um, for, both anim for both visits. So that made me feel really good tended to be about 75. So um, you might look at that and be like, whoa, that is so high. Um, so if 75, it's, it is that high um, because, probably because they were on isoporine. One of the reasons we use female rhesus is because they have much less, in fact, almost human width of their um, temporalis muscles. Males tend to have this really thick temporalis muscle, which increases the distance between the motor cortex and the, uh, between the scalp and the motor cortex. So the females um, didn't have this thick temporalis muscle, which gave us sort of better access to the motor cortex itself. And for this um, initial proof of principle kind of model building um, thing, we just collected the recruitment curve. So um, standard recruitment curve, we did five MEPs at various levels, going from 75% to 130% of the given animal's resting motor threshold five MEPs and they were all um, sort of randomized. So that was pretty good. Um, we published these data in brain stimulation last year. Um, again, five female rhesus we used neuro-navigated targeting. Um, and you can see on the image on the left, um, this is um, this brain model comes from SimNibs. Um, and we are super thankful to Alex and Yvonne for giving us these, um, providing us with the head mesh. Um, <clears throat> we're working on developing this for our males now, but we actually may need to ask the guy for, for some more help. Um, so, um, but we developed this, um, so we, you can see here on the, um, y-axis is the percent of resting motor threshold um, and on the x and i'm um, sorry on x-axis on the y-axis is the amplitude of the motor evoked potential and as you can see here we got for each animal each animal is represented by a different colored line we did tend to get nice smooth recruitment curves um, that were actually pretty steep the error bars on each of the line represents the the variance for that given animal so as i mentioned each animal came back twice um, and so the error bars tended to be pretty small, um, which was um, showed we had really nice test retest reliability. Um, and that was true for the arm location, which is on the left side of the screen, and then the leg location, which is on the right side of the screen. Um, in this case, the uh, y axis is different between the graph on the left and the right. For the left side, for the right side, um, you can see two of the animals when we were placing the coil over the midline, which is where we got some signal on the left, on the leg, um, two of them had very, very strong um, feet contractions or foot contractions, um, while many of the others actually, or three of the other three um, had pretty small contractions. So the foot was actually much harder for us to get than the leg. Um, and then we moved to have one more experiment, which we did in December. Um, I don't have a lot of data from this yet, but just to kind of show you briefly, we did a quick recruitment curve before and after three doses of intermittent beta burst. So to tie this back to the first part of the talk, um, we wanted to see if in this very controlled environment, if 600 pulses of theta burst gave us an increase in cortical excitability or decrease in cortical excitability. And then because so many people now are trying to stack the theta burst sessions, 
many per day. We wanted to see if we could get those effects um, repeated at the second and third visit or if they would change otherwise. So this was delivered um, uh, over in um, 11 animals. So these were 11, in this case, male rhesus animals. Um, for an NHP study, 11 is a huge study actually. Um, so we did 11 animals, all on isoflurane. Um, you can see this is all sort of fresh out of the you know, Excel sheet just a few minutes ago. Um, so it's not really, I don't know, error bars on anything, but um, this is the peak to peak um, EMG. <clears throat> and so the blue bars represent um, at each of the percent motor, uh, at each of the um, percent machine output, in this case, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95 percent of the machine output, the baseline EMG peak to peak, and then is blue. And then the orange is the um, effect after a single session of ITBS on the left. And what um, you can kind of see here is that there was a, seemed to be a fairly consistent increase in cortical excitability following one session of ITBS. Um, so that's kind of neat actually. Um, but then the second session, we don't really seem to see as big of a change. And the third session, we also don't seem to see as big of a change. And just one last slide, and just another way to just view these same data. So the, there's three sessions of TBS here, all ITBS 600 pulses. And on the um, graph further, the first set of bars on the left, you see they tend to all kind of go up. Um, and, but then we sort of lose that over time. So um, we're still digesting these data. I haven't prepared them for anything yet. Um, but I think, you know, as I kind of wrote in the red, the best thing about these data, I think from my perspective, is the orderly nature of the MEPs at 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95. So I'm pretty sure we can get good MEPs in this animal model. We just need to figure out um, a little more after that. And that's all. Thank you guys so much for your attention. Um, there's a lot of people to thank for this, um, including the um, NHP lab and Dan McCallie and Daniel Lynch that did most of the um, human study. Thanks. Thank you, Colin. Really exciting data, both in humans and in non-human primates. So I'm really looking forward to this massive study that you just showed when you will find what is the effects of um, consequent stimulation. Uh, and I think uh, the heat map of variability was rather impressive. And there is a uh, questions from the audience about that. Uh, would you expect that um, 10 Hertz RTMS would actually be less variable than that? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think, I do think there might be an answer to that out there, um, but I do know, and if anybody knows it, feel free to chime in, um, but, um, I actually suspect it might be just as variable. It's just that we haven't really studied it as much because ITBS and CTBS are so quick. Um, it lends itself to all these innovative experimental designs um, that just haven't been done for um, 10 Hertz yet. Yeah. Do you have an idea how we can you know, predict in humans what would be the best point on this heat map? Yeah, so I would love to know that, I promise you. Um, writing this, you know, writing the manuscript, it took a while to get it published because we were trying to figure out how to interpret the data or kind of provide some insight for the field to move forward. You know, I think what is does seem to be known um, and published on a lot is that um, priming seems to increase the likelihood that TMS will have an effect. Um, and there's been some really nice studies um, out of Germany and um, out of Australia that have shown um, the effects of priming um, on ITBS, at least, effects. Um, and so they seem to be amplified afterwards. And I actually think there, I don't remember offhand, but I do believe that there's a study that has shown that if you prime the individual, the effects of ITBS are less variable than if you don't prime the individual. 